Hi, this is Carrie Brownstein. This is DJ Premier. This is Darren Aronofsky. You got the Rizzo right here. Rose McGowan. Right here. Hey. Taisha Tyler. The Tribe Called Quest. Fred Armisen. Fritz Paul. Javier Munoz. Seth Meyers. Frankie Cosmos. Flying Lotus. Hi, we're Haim, and you're listening to the Talk House Podcast. Ow! Hello, and welcome to the Talk House Podcast. I'm Josh Modell. This week, we've got one of those fun conversations where the reverence is on full display from the get-go. When we asked singer-songwriter Biba Doobie who she'd be interested in speaking with for the podcast, she immediately responded, Nina Person of the Cardigans. You can hear how excited she is right from the start. Now, for those unfamiliar with Biba Doobie, she was born in the Philippines, raised in London, and found fame over the past couple of years via platforms like TikTok. Canadian rapper Paufu built his song Deathbed around B's song Coffee, giving her a huge hit with what was essentially the first song she ever wrote. She followed that with a string of really strong EPs and then dropped her proper debut album called Fake It Flowers in October of last year. It's a fantastic set of fuzzy pop songs that clearly found a ton of inspiration in the music of the 1990s. Bands like The Sundays, Pavement, Belly, and even Daniel Johnston, who comes up in this conversation, have been bandied about in reviews. Biba Doobie is hitting the road this year with her fantastic label mates Black Star Kids. You can see all the tour dates on our site or on hers. In the meantime, check out a little bit of her song, Last Day on Earth. Now, if you listen closely, you've probably heard a little bit of the Cardigans in there, as well as those other 1990s influences. The Cardigans also found fame in those alternative nation days. They had a huge hit in 1996 with the song Love Fool, whose chorus was imprinted on a generation, and released a string of excellent albums right up through 2005, when they went into a sort of semi-retirement, still emerging occasionally to play shows. At the front of the band was charming lead singer Nina Person, who went on to form another band called A Camp, as well as release a solo album. She's also, admiringly, enjoying not being all that busy nowadays. She plays the occasional show, but also teaches and does pottery. It sounds really nice to me. B and Nina had a really lively, cross-generational conversation here. You can hear the admiration in B's voice and the real interest from Nina about how things are different as a 20-something woman in the music business now versus when she was topping the charts. They also talk about social media, Nina's favorite moments from the Cardigans catalog, Red Pandas, and gross hotel rooms with shag carpet, sperm, and toenails. Yuck. Enjoy. But yeah, before we start anything, I just want to say that I'm like, you are probably my main inspiration for all the music I write. So it's kind of crazy that I'm talking to you right now. I have so many questions. I. Yeah, I really look up to you and I love the cardigans. And I was always curious about your writing style and how, like, how do you write a song? Did you write it with your band? Did you write it yourself? Or did you write the chords yourself? Yeah, tell me. Well, first of all, thanks, B. That really (laughs) makes me truly proud to hear. Uh, Thank you so much. That's lovely. Well, my writing style has been very different uh, throughout the years. Like, unlike you, I've never really written on instruments. And uh, unlike you, I did not start writing songs from the beginning. I sort of, I joined the Cardigans, not even because I wanted to do music. I pretty much joined because I was bored. (laughs) They wanted me to join the band because they liked my taste in music more. And then they checked me out and see how I was singing. And I think it was acceptable. And it was mostly based on my record collection that I got to join the band. So from the beginning, it was this, these two guys, Peter and Magnus from the Cardigans that wrote the songs. So I came in and uh, immediately from the beginning, didn't write much, but I, I gradually started to more and more, especially first lyrics yeah. together with the band. And when we wrote, it would be Peter, who's the main songwriter from the Cardigans, who would have melodies and maybe chords or snippets. And then we would just take it from there and write together and, and the lyrics would grow on me. And then that sort of my part of the songwriting really grew naturally throughout the years. Mm-hmm. And I started to write uh, the latest Cardigans record. I wrote some music also, but I've mostly just written vocal melodies and, and the lyrics. The song was just so catchy, like you just hit the nail on the head of just trying, like making such a great pop song, but like not even like the commercial pop, it was like this, your own type of world. It, yeah, it's wild. And you mentioned records. 
and they apparently chose you for your amazing music taste. Can you tell me what <laughs> music you were listening to at the time? We loved anything British at the time. This was the, the early 90s, so it's like the Britpop was huge and we loved mm -hmm. that. So I think with the records I had that they uh, thought were promising was like Stone Roses, like that uh, Stone Roses. Uh, do you know the Swedish artist Stina Nordenstam? Oh my God, I love Stina Nordenstam. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So her yeah. early records was super in, like influential on me. And that's one reason. They thought if she, if I liked the way she's singing, then I would be open to singing sort of in a not very sort of, you know, trained mm -hmm. traditional way kind of. And I also love The Sundays and Amazing. You probably heard that also, yeah. I love The Sundays. Wow, I could really hear that in like the way you sing. Yeah, and it's almost embarrassing because if you listen to early cardigans, you can really hear that I'm totally imitating, which is a good place to start off from, you know, before you find your own fairies. Inspirations are always like, I think they're always really important. I feel like referencing things in music, I think people see it as such a bad thing, but I think it's like, always really fun like I remember like um, I released a song called Cologne and I just completely <laughs> referenced you guys um, aha okay <laughs> yeah I was just like yeah this has to be like a cardigans song so oh that's that's awesome I, I think I even maybe you know that but I also sing about Cologne in one in a song in a cardigan song not like the theme is Cologne but I sing it we have a song where we drop a lot of names of cities but I think that's a super if you think that's a bad thing then you're just completely like ripping away the rug from under you because it's the it's the truest way of learning I think especially as a singer because imitation is everything really mm -hmm. I think it's healthy and is the song you were talking about where you mentioned is it daddy's car yeah oh so you listen to old really old cardigans too then I've listened to every single record like religiously I think my favorite is life or like Gran Turismo yeah, no, I'm completely obsessed. I, I know that you weren't originally planning to go the music route and you just mm. loved the idea of music. So what was like your plan in life before everything happened with the cardigans and itself? Well, my plan in life was to, I started an art school that was sort of like a general art school. So I tried all kinds of medium. So I, I just knew that I wanted to do something within, well, uh, like express it, like, uh, painting or designing. I, I loved pottery and I loved photography. So I wasn't really sure what I would, I just wanted to try all these things out, but I, that I would do something creative in that manner was clear to me. And that's what I had thought for my whole life. And then that, that it was during that year in art school that I had to start to play hooky like several days a week just to go away to make our first record. But they were sweet. The teachers at that school, they actually gave me full grades anyway, because they said that, well, you were doing something really creative, so you can because yeah. you, you need the grades, they said. So I guess <laughs> they gave me props for stuff I wasn't even there for. That's good. Oh, wow. I know that you teach in Copenhagen. Do you teach music? How do you find that? Because I've always wanted to teach, like, I've always wanted to be an elementary teacher. And, like, I see music. I kind of fell into music. I didn't really seek out this job. They wanted to have a teacher at the school who was not from an academic background with somebody who'd rather had a life experience. So I I just said yes, because I thought it was a great chance to try it. And I think it's amazing. I'm actually not teaching music, I'm teaching sort of, or coaching in uh, finding your, sort of uh, working on your creativity and finding methods and uh, oh, wow. being aware of your context and, and pretty much meeting up with them every week to make sure that they're also doing like an artistic development, not just getting skills, but also honing their art sort of so it's an amazing subject to teach and I learn just because I'm not from an academic music background that's what I gain by hanging out with these people both the other professors and the students so I think it's amazing and just to sort of get to be part of what people are doing currently how, how they do it the te technologically and uh, what they're drawn to aesthetically and, and and everything yeah I can see how that can be also really inspiring for you but it's good to I was going to say don't don't rush teaching now you gotta just, <laughs> yeah. you know you see what I mean it's really good that you know that you have other things that you can mm -hmm. find valuable in life for when you don't think it's sort of working anymore or not fun anymore but don't yeah I used to write all my music myself in my room and the last EP I released was a really collaborative one and I've been collaborating really closely with my guitarist Jacob and it's the first time I'm working with someone so closely and it's kind of outside my comfort zone but it feels like I have less weight on my shoulders and 
two minds are better than one. Did you feel like you had to open up to let somebody in? Mm. Or uh, what was it that was uh, difficult, do you think, in the beginning? Um, I think what was difficult was that I was so, I guess it was, I was a bit anal with my music. I was like, no one touched my music. <laughs> um, and I think it was a big deal for me, even like the first time I worked with like a new producer, that was nerve wracking for me. But now I think it's like the best thing to do. Like as an artist, it helps you grow. And I always wondered, I always wondered how you found collaborating with your band so closely. Did that help you learn? Did that help you write songs easier? Well, obviously that's the way I started and that's, I don't think I would have started without that. So it was an amazing thing for a long, long time because that's where I learned everything pretty much. And I thought it was wonderful, but I think then as I, as I grew, I, I sort of had maybe the opposite uh, journey from you in a way, because the more I grew as a songwriter, first starting to write all the lyrics and then starting to have stronger opinions, like knowing my voice better and starting to have stronger opinions about music, then I started to feel like it was, uh, started to get a little crowded <laughs> in there, to be honest. Um, and it's, and, the, and Peter who wrote the music in the Cardigans, he is a strong force also, obviously, because he's amazing. And he sort of, he has to be quite autonomous when he, when he writes. We had to work really hard on how to get in on the, in the process, sort of. But then when I did sort of do my first record outside the Cardigans, which was a camp, then I uh, immediately sought out people that I uh, was writing and working with. And I insisted on, I mean, I could easily have made those records like my solo record, but it was still really important for me to call it like a project and have like a band name on it. Cause I couldn't bear the thought of, be, of like being the artist. Uh, I've only done one record under my own name, but I really felt like I need to be in a band like situation to feel comfortable. Cause I need, like you say, you, you, uh, you share the work and you, you share the, the pride you take in the music and you bounce back and forth and you're just more clever people making the decisions that always helped me also because I maybe didn't have that. I never started out a very self-sufficient process to begin with, but that came eventually. Yeah. But do you, so do you have sort of like a band? Cause it, it, I've seen quite, quite a lot of pictures of you with, it looks like the same musicians. I have like a touring band. We play shows together and we're very much like, really close like yeah typical brown best friends and only recently is um have I been starting to like work with them much more intimately especially with Jacob and you yeah, know they always they play on the records we've never written all together I usually write my songs myself or sometimes co-write it with Jacob which I'm doing quite recently but yeah it's just like it's interesting how I don't know how much I've kind of matured throughout the years and kind of opened up and I think it's cool. I know that you've released some, obviously, like your solo records. And then with like the cardigan stuff, did did they like have all the instrumentation done and then you hopped on at the end? Or was it like a much more like collaborative process? It was quite collaborative. He would come with demos that pretty much was just his on, he on guitar singing, you know, like uh bullshit lyrics like made up <laughs> made up lyrics and then we would take it from there sometimes uh, all of us like the drummer would sit and figure out his part and like sometimes we would just sit simply take it to the rehearsal space and play it till we everybody found their parts kind of so, so it, it was usually like that that um there would be like an embryo to a vocal melody that was a start-off point and often he had sung something that wasn't even real words but for, i'm sure you recognize this but but phonetically, it sounded so good. So when I wrote the lyrics, I couldn't help but sort of start off at singing what he sang, even if it didn't mean anything, until I found what real words matched it somehow. Because some some vowels and some words just marry so well with music, so you can't really separate it. So that's all. That's and I think still that's a big inspiration, just how words sound musically. I sometimes when I have a like when I just have at a standstill and can't come up with anything, I just sort of sing without words just to see, you know, the, the phrasings and the, and the vowels and the sounds that, that work with it. Yeah, no, definitely. That's pretty much how I write my music. I kind of find words that don't really make sense, but just fit perfectly with the melody or just feel nice to say. And the, yeah, that is like a crossword puzzle. Then you just fill in the gaps because yeah. you can make anything work really. So what is... This is probably like a hard question, but what is your favorite song 
that you guys have released with the cardigans with the cardigans yeah. uh, oh it's really hard like there's many and there's they're very very they're, they're, they're very different also but i think that goes for everybody you, i tend to like the most recent stuff the best because it feels that of course that feels like most like myself where i am today so i love a lot of songs from that record called super extra gravity yeah i'm trying to think i love a song like I actually love a song that I feel like nobody else got, but a song like Losing a Friend. On that record, I enjoyed so much uh, writing from the standpoint of a really sort of not very likable person. And I thought that was really, really freeing and really fun to just sing about really messed up ways of looking at relationships and stuff. So I li- those are fun, I think. But then there are songs from another record uh, called Long Gone Before Daylight, like one song called Feathers and Down, I'm I'm really happy with. Because that's one that I can sing still, and I, I feel like that was a really... I just feel that it's very current still, and I, I feel really happy about how the music flows in a, in a good way. Every time a new album comes up, it's like you... It just sounds more mature and mature in the best way possible. And I can tell by that last record, it, there was like so much confidence, so much angst in your voice, which I really admire. Yeah, it's a little sad. I, I really like where that record went also. And it's kind of, that, that can make me really sad that we never did any more records. We did start up like uh, making another record. And I think it could have been great if we had continued on that same path, but then that, that really never happened. Are you still writing music? Well, I don't write with the cardigans. We play live with the cardigans, but I'm, I'm, and I haven't been writing a lot lately at all, actually, but I'm gonna actually this fall, just start to sort of see some people and see what happens oh, kind of. Cool. So there's there's a song I really like uh, that I'm gonna try with somebody and then I'm gonna record a duet with a really talented woman. So th- just to do just to do something sort of. I just, my problem right now is I don't, just don't know really what kind of music I would like to do and how to do it. And, you know, if I even want to put out records. I think that if I just knew myself, what I wanted to do, I would be able to do it and find people to work with, which which I'm really lucky to. I just really feel like I don't know. I'm also like, I, I'm a bad influence. I mean, don't, uh, <laughs> I also really enjoy not working hard. So the way I live now and teaching a little bit and then just hanging out and I, I have a pottery studio that I go to sometimes and I, oh, you know, so I have quite a, a chill life that I like. My kid is still small. So, but I think there's going to be a time. I, I really don't feel like I've done my last record. I think that's it. So maybe when I'm 65, but you're making your record now, right? You're working in the studio, right? Yeah, I'm currently doing my second record, which is... That's amazing. Are you in the studio working right now? Um, Yeah, I'm currently rehearsing every single day because I've got a few gigs coming up. So yeah, it's been tiring, but it's it's fun hanging out. Like I could assume that you and your bandmates were all like super chill with each other. I think that's the main thing about this job, I have to say, both what I'm in now and in retrospect, that just the the people. Musicians are great people. You meet so many amazing, interesting people. So it's such a great world to be, both your close ones and the ones you just happen by. If you're, you're, you're gonna play, are you gonna play your own club shows or are you doing festivals? Or what is it that you have coming up? I'm playing festivals this year and then I've got a tour coming up at the end of the year. How does that feel? It must be so much fun. I'm really nervous. Like we've got a festival coming up next week and I'm, I'm quite scared, but because it's the first live performance I've done for two years because of COVID. Right. Did you do any like Zoom performances or anything? Oh yeah. They were just so strange because I was just like, there's, you can't like, you can't feel, you can't hear the crowd. And it's just like, it's not the same. You're going to go crazy probably with an audience again and new music. I might go a bit crazy. Do not know? too crazy but it'll probably end up being that way because I haven't been to a festival in god knows how long yeah I was gonna ask in talking about like festivals and touring and whatnot how did you find touring well, like at the peak of um the, your career was it really intense like I could, I could only imagine like how because every song off um it was like great yeah like every song just went completely like was a hit did you ever find it too overwhelming at times and how did you deal with that I did. I, I really did. And I think that's partly because it wasn't really a, a childhood dream of mine, so to speak, to just, I, I love music and I love to be creative and to, to hang out with this kind this, this, these people, musicians. And But I never actually had an urge to sort of have people look at me or to be famous or to be, you know, interviewed. 
that was not something that I really had in me, kind of. I didn't uh, mind it because I'm fairly social. But I, when you, when I did that every day, all the time, and in sometimes quite uncomfortable environments, as you were, yeah, and so forth, I, it did uh, definitely wear on me. And it was also like a little. I, my, and my band members are the best, and I still have to say to this, like you know, after the meet, the meet I know so many people from the '90s who totally didn't make it through the me too oh, yeah. you know storm but so i'm so proud of my my bandmates they're the best men so they were only helpful but in the business back then it was quite lonely and quite odd to be a woman because it was so it was lonely actually and it was would be lonely and awkward i had a constant feeling of not being enough because i felt like i was not what the business hoped that i would be kind of yeah no i definitely relate to that yeah yeah you do it's like, I obviously, like you, I just never really expected this to be a thing. So at the beginning of it all, it was like panic attack after panic attack. And like touring was really hard at the beginning. And like, I'm so appreciative of the band I have now because it's like, I can't wait to tour with them because I think it's really important to have good people around you. And like, especially you touched on the topic of being a woman, especially being like a lead, like a, a lead female singer in a band in the 90s I can only imagine how strange that would be like how did you find that did you feel empowered at times or like was there moments where you're like oh my god this is yes yeah, because I'm a woman and I can't do half the shit that men have to do that men could do yeah but well it was quite rare then I, I first of all I, I just felt like there was so few people around me that I could identify with because there were there were a couple of women but it was just certain very narrow roles you could be like four different kinds of characters kind of you know and i, did, I felt didn't feel like i was like any of those and also there were so many you know projections sort of on me i've always had a good self-confidence and everything but i felt like the things that were expected from me even even if it, it wasn't always explicit but you know about what i people assumed that i would want to talk about and you know, I would talk about stuff in interviews and then I realized they didn't write anything of the things I really said. They just wrote things that they had, you know, they wanted to talk about more sensational things. But now I, I have a feeling like in, in, for you now, I just feel like the good thing is that there's so much more women uh, doing music. So you have more uh, people to mirror yourself in and also more. You just don't have to talk so much about that you're a woman. You just you can talk yeah. as a musician, and you don't have to talk about fashion every time you do an interview. You know, it's just more more room for individual variation, kind of. In the, yeah, which I'm really happy that it's changed. You yeah, know, hundred percent. I feel like right now there's like a good group of female like Asian musicians specifically that are coming up, and it's obviously like so admiring to see. And yeah, there are moments where like there's it's still in the industry like all that stuff still exists and it's you know I could wish that for it to all go away but it's you know it's so hard it's like always going to be present I feel like it's become like the norm within the music industry and as much as it's good for me right now at this day and age it's still one of the hardest things to be a female musician um but obviously then again, mm. like, um, I appreciate like all the other girls doing the same thing as me and I appreciate you and all the incredible women from the 90s that I really look up to and my mom used to play I remember her playing all your songs and being like damn <laughs> I oh, want to okay. I want to rock out in a band like that one day maybe are you friendly with other like uh, female artists of your generation also I know a good handful um that I talked to um well I went on tour with Clara and I know that she always has advice, like advice if I need some advice, I always go to her, especially like I learned a lot on that tour, actually. And, um, you know, how she dealt with things and like how to deal with things. And I was like, wow, you can just say no. <laughs> like, yes. I mean, I have a problem of being like a pushover sometimes. And only recently have I been like, nope, I don't want to do that. And that you can do it just because you don't want to. I had a thing where every time I said I didn't want to do anything, uh, my various managers or whatever tour managers would have to be like, then we have to say that you're sick, that your voice is bad. So it always had to be like a physical problem. And that also that made me feel like such a weakling because I'm not really, I just, you know, if I had a bad day, they always had to say like, Nina got stung by a bee and had a really <laughs> bad re allergic reaction to it or something like that. It always, and it always had to be, if the band wanted to cancel something, it also always had to be 
because of me. So it was, uh, yeah, that was really <laughs> frustrating. <laughs> I feel like that that's probably the same case with me. Yeah, yeah, with your in your band situation for sure. That's also one thing that when you have when you're singing, like if you're a guitar player, you can be quite hungover actually and do a good show still. Uh, but you're sort of when you when you're singing, you're you you're sort of also that's another pressure you need to take care of. Like you need to just have your instrument functioning kind of. Yeah, definitely, I feel like. I appreciate my band a lot because if I fuck up, I know they've got my back. Mm. If, I, if I play a chord wrong, I've got like a lead guitarist who, who's got my back. So I know if, the, if it's a bad day for me, I'm like, it's fine. I know my band's super tight. Mm. <laughs> but singing for me is always like, I watch like a lot of your live videos and it's crazy how much you sound the same live. Ah. Did you ever get like singing teachers, like singing lessons? I did. Uh, I, I did a during the Gran Turismo touring. We toured a lot, and I, we also didn't really have a. I don't. I was just really overworked. Also, I had not been to see teachers, and I did not warm up or anything. And I partied, and I smoked, and I, you know, was actually also in a, in a good place. So my voice totally went out. You know, I got the nodes. The yeah, I think you call it the nodes. So I had to interrupt a tour to go back home to do this uh, vocal cord surgery which was super, super, oh but yeah, talk about having to end a tour because of me. So after that, after, so then I had to have like pretty much, uh, you know, physical therapy for my vocal cords just oh, to wow. recover from surgery. But after that, I realized that I had to, to learn some tricks just to sort of preserve it. So, so I took some training. I think it's always really helpful. I feel like, especially like, like the scene I'm in like I do tend to party a lot and I don't really take care of my voice and like I found learning from a singing teacher on how to like preserve my voice although she tells me to be completely silent after a show I'm like yeah I'll do that <laughs> yeah, that's hard and then you can't when you when you're on tour like days off are unfortunately so expensive so there's always going to be a pressure of you on you to sing as as many nights in a row as you can which I think is really hard during the peak of your career, was there a moment where you were like, crap, I don't, I don't know if I can do this anymore? I mean, there would be moments when I just sort of felt, I was just, uh, just because uh, I've been hanging out so much with family just now, mm -hmm. my parents-in-law's house is so full of relatives that me and my husband had to stay in a motel mm -hmm. nearby just to be able to, to see them. And staying in a motel in the U.S. was brought me back so hard to like touring memories. Really. And this motel room that we stayed in made me remember when we had. Do you remember the? Did you see the TV show uh, Nine O Two One O Beverly Hills? Yeah. We called it. But yeah. So we did an appearance on that show in '97, perhaps or something like that. And that was for me and for us, even in Sweden, that was a huge show. So that was like one of the biggest thing we did, I would say. So we were in like Hollywood. Uh, shooting this episode with this cast of 90210, blah, blah, blah. And everybody was like so excited that we got to do this show. And then our tour just continued. You know how your everyday life on yeah. tour is just the same, no matter how, what your success is like. So I just remember it was a couple of weeks later and I was at a, such, a, such a gross motel room somewhere on a day off on tour on like a, on a shag carpet that was full of toenails that it was so, it was like, you know, sperm and toenails. <laughs> it was so gross. And there was one TV that I did. It must have been really old, like, you know, a square TV with a really terrible picture. And this uh, episode was uh, airing for the first time. So I decided that would be fun. I'll watch that episode uh, since I have a day off. So I was lying on my stomach watching this, on this, on this gross rug, watching this show with myself on it. And I was like, it was just so sad. It was just so confusing to me. Life was still really... The same pressure, the same daily work, and and I, you know, wasn't really happy uh, necessarily. So it was very bizarre, kind of. I remember that just because I thought about it the other day when I was in in the re similar room eating the same plastic wrapped muffins for for <laughs> breakfast. <laughs> You're going to the U.S. right for a tour? Yeah, we've got the U.S. this year. We did the U.S. like two years ago. The, that was the, one of the first ones we did I just love UK tours and I love like Europe America sometimes scares me because it's just so far away from home and like mm. we didn't stay in motels in America we stayed in like really like shitty travel lodges in mm. England and I just remember like it being the most depressing thing like coming back to an empty hotel room mm. and being like 
this is so sad like after a show and like you do whatever and then you come back to like a really like yellow dim lit mm. weird travel lodge room that smells like the last person that stayed there yeah it's weird and then and you sort of all you want to do is hang out with your band mates and sort of decompose but you also know that you really should just be quiet and rest it's really hard to wind down after a show now we're talking about the negative things but then of course there's really fun stuff I just have to ask you like a nerdy question because I read somewhere that you're that you're a fan of Daniel Johnston. I love Daniel Johnston. I've got a tattoo of oh. his eye bat. Oh, you do? Oh, is it one of his drawings? Oh, that's amazing. What a good idea to do one of his drawings. I love the way he writes. It's just, it comes from such an innocent place. It's mm-hmm. like, you can tell like, the genuine emotion that comes from his voice. Yeah, it's amazing. I, I just thought it was great because I, I mean, I, that, that person from your generation still is like, had, had heard about him. What other music? Have you been listening to music recently? Uh, recently, uh, let me think. Well, now I'm having a really fun time because my son, who's 10, is really, he's really into music. So I'm actually consuming a lot of music through him, which could be embarrassing, but it's fun. He's got good taste. He's really into, into rap and uh, all these great new pop stars that come up. Like, I love Doja Cat. Like, uh, oh, I love that. Uh, yeah, I, yeah, I think yeah. a lot of... Uh, 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 artists that are coming up like I think Frank Ocean is fantastic that's not super new but I mean I really like this uh, uh, Brit- I, I think she's I'm not sure if she's British or American um, Aldous Harding I return to a lot I think she's fantastic yeah no she's amazing she did a song called The Barrel which is which yeah. Is amazing yeah for example but that it's fun to just listen to my son's playlist actually because he he listens to all these uh like uh, soundcloud rappers and some is not so good but some is amazing if you could go back in time and give yourself advice on what to do differently or what or just to keep in mind what would you tell yourself well i i would tell myself to uh be kinder to myself mm-hmm. to try to try to this classic thing like try to look at yourself the way others look at you because because you're not doing it in a kind way <laughs> you know just to give yourself a break a little bit because I, I, I can often feel now that I didn't have to feel bad about a lot of things because I was not as bad as I thought uh, kind of that's one thing and also just that I wish I had enjoyed it more while it I mean I wish I had enjoyed as I, I talked about this motel room that made me sad at the time but I learned to go for it and have a lot more fun like 10 years into my career, I wished I had a lot earlier just to really have fun and just to really seek out people you want to hang out with and, you know, go where it's warm and just enjoy it, sort of. That's one thing. Yeah, no, I feel that. I feel like artist to artist, I feel like during my career, I had all these, like, you were saying this earlier, I hate how this is part of me, like, my head, is I always care about what people think. It's like constantly and people have this, you know, idea of me that I'm so terrified about disappointing them, Mm. disappointing and and not being the person they expected me to be. And it's reassuring to hear you say to be kind of to yourself if if you were to go back in time, because I should probably think about doing that. (laughs) I'm really curious because you it's such a different time now with social media which is on on one hand you have you have more of a chance than i did in a way of letting telling people who you are you know and giving a, an accurate picture of yourself do you see what i mean like you didn't you were you're not really in the hands of other people to to write to interpret what you're saying but you yeah. can actually say it directly so mm. so that i can see that's that's a really great thing but on the other hand there's an expectation if you don't if you don't care about social media and if you don't do it enough that it's also a, I can imagine a pressure to to keep uh, updating and posting and be active and be sort of always sort of catching attention and collecting uh, followers and everything. I kind of go on social media quite naturally and I try to like show everyone like my real self. It's just like I feel like kids have now adapted to just like despite seeing someone online assuming what they were like and not kind of like reading between the lines or like I know no one will ever know what I'm actually like unless they know me in real life but I feel like there's definitely a barrier in social media that is inevitably there because people will never actually you know understand who I am and that's completely normal but that 
but with social media there's all it's so open that you can see every comment and anyone is entitled to their own opinion and it's just hard to just like not not read it and not care about it which thankfully recently I've just stopped like reading anything um I've stop like looking through comments or looking at what people are saying about my music and just kind of caring about what I think about my music and what the people I care about think about my music. But yeah, I, I do see that how social media has definitely helped me since the beginning. I feel like it was so much more hard back then with nothing, like all you had was like magazines and like people writing about you, people writing what they thought you were like. Yeah, always filtering sort of. But I think when I've looked through your videos and listened through your music, I feel like you have a really, you're at a really good place where you sort of, I mean, I know you have people usually helping you make videos and stuff like that, but I think that you're really good already at expressing a complexity of a, of a person sort of, and, you know, different dimensions that you have, that, that you are a 21-year-old girl, which you are, right, 21? <laughs> I, was, yeah. I was doing my math. <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> But, you know, life is complicated. There's all kinds of shades uh, mm -hmm. in the way you perceive life and how you're uh, expressing. So I think I think you're, you're already you already have like you can you can sense it sort of in in your output. Do you think that you are you going to tour the rest of Europe at all? It's like my dream to do a European tour and to go to Japan. We had uh, a couple of records that were really doing well in Japan. So I went a lot for a couple of years and it's amazing. So much fun. And now I started to come back. So we're, I'm going back uh, next Easter again with my family because I oh, love it so much. So the festival you're going to do, is that full capacity? Is it full on audience? It's so strange. So it's like, so it's an ex it's an experiment festival. It's um, Latitude Festival in Suffolk. And yeah, no, I'm playing there next Friday, which is pretty nerve wracking. It's 40,000 people. Hmm. I'm playing main stage. I'm just... Oh, man, did you used did you used to get nervous before shows? Or yeah, like, yeah. It was it's so bad. I feel like it's gotten worse because of COVID, and I haven't played for two years. I just like, I feel like I'm going to be sick. It's always to, to, if you've had a long break and you're out of the, out of practice a little bit, mm -hmm. it's always nervous. But it's that that's when it's also the best to have a band that you like the people because to have yeah. just know that they're there with you I playing so, with. Like I'm so like it's so like reassuring like turning back and seeing like my drummer's face or like my bass because they're like my best friends it's just like I can't even imagine like performing live by myself in front of so much people I wish that we could figure out a different way to do it because you know when you're a lead singer how you always you just sort of can't help it but be always a little bit in front of the people so they're always behind you they're never in your eyesight mm -hmm. yeah you know I always find that really disturbing that I had to like turn around in order to see my my people Well, they can they can sort of have be really be in touch and and have a thing going while they're playing. Yeah, they can go off with each other. Like the bassist walks off to the drum, and I just have yeah. to stay completely still. <laughs> Because if I would just see them moving around in the peripheral uh, vision, I would that would be helpful, sort of. I, I and I've been trying sometimes, like let me stand a little behind, you know, that you form a triangle like that instead. But it never really works. This a it's a shame. Well, We need rear view mirrors. Yeah, we can have that. <laughs> so you can see everyone. Are you going to play any shows soon? You thinking? I have booked. I have a little duo that I really enjoy. It's me and a well. There's the, there was a band in the '90s called the Soundtrack of Our Lives. Really good band. So the keyboard player for that band uh, and I have a duo. So we just booked two of those. You know, these awesome summer shows, small audience outside kind of. Whoa. So I have those two, uh, and then that's it. Then we have a. We have a show booked in beginning of December, I think, with the Cardigans in Jakarta, Indonesia. That's, it's one that's been postponed three times, I think. So I'm still not sure it's going to happen. But that's uh, that's in the calendar. I go in Indonesia. That's crazy. Yeah, that is crazy. And to, to, to go that far now to play, I don't know what's, uh, if it's going to happen. But that's well. what's like the best, like the coolest place you guys have ever played or you've ever played. Like, Well, the coolest place would be like, Because it's always really fun to play like all over England and like around the US and uh, so forth, but and like around big cities in, in Europe. But the coolest places would be that we played like we played Belarus. That was really cool, just because not a lot of bands had gone 
uh, had gone at that time. And to play Japan, the more sort of exotic it would be, the, the more fun kind of it would be. Oh my God, I can only imagine what Japan is like. I literally cannot wait. I'm like obsessed with red pandas. So like if I go to Japan, I'm just like going to go straight to the red panda. That's an animal, right? Yes, Why is it an a band? So I'm like, like no, I bet yeah. she's talking about a cool new band that I've never oh, heard no, of. No, no. <laughs> it's like the cutest, like, it's so cute. I can't believe I'm showing you. Oh, I can't show you a picture of a red panda, but they're basically like. Yeah, I want to see. Okay, I'll Google it here then. Let me see. They're so, so cute. They're adorable. Okay. <laughs> Images. Oh, wow. Oh, they look, it looks, oh, wow. They looks like a, some, like a mix between a fog and a. Yeah. And, a, and a fox, I mean, and a panda. Yeah, foxy. I mean, their features are so, yeah, I think they're perfect. I was always also really curious. I know, like, I bet you, like, during the time, you just kind of threw clothes on, on tour, because that's what usually ends up happening when you're on the road. But, like, what, did you ever have, like, a go, because I love fashion. Yeah, I can tell from your pictures, yeah. Did you ever have, like, a go-to outfit to wear on stage? Like, was there anything that you just, like, absolutely love to wear you wore and you were like oh my god this is my outfit for the rest of my life yeah I think it's all about go-to outfits in a way because it's really hard I think to expect yourself to pick something out like every night so I always pretty much find something that I like and then stick to it sometimes I will have a couple of uh, like versions of the same thing I used to have a really hard time I still sort of do have a hard time singing in dresses I don't know why I think it was because I don't really know how to move in a dress, but I've started to be better at it lately. Yeah, they're quite awkward. Like, I just wouldn't know where to clip the thing on a dress. I feel like yeah. I, tried, I went to rehearsals in a dress today because it was it was boiling hot. And I tried clipping my inner battery pack, like, on the back of my dress. <gasps> and it was sliding my dress down. I can never wear it. Yeah, and then you get a bump. But you should go to, like, or if you have somebody who's really good at sewing, try to make yourself a belt. Oh, yeah. You can make it out of elastic so it can sit under your dress and you can wear it. If it's a really tight dress, it's always going to be a problem, of course. But then you can wear that belt like under dresses and just with a little pocket for the thing that you can always stick it in. Oh, that's smart. To have custom, actually make some really uh, comfortable custom made items for you. I, I once had like a saddle maker make myself a belt with a huge sort of holster really for my belt pack and for my harmonicas whoa it's almost like a, you know where the cowboys put their bullets <laughs> and have my harmonicas so like that so do something fun like that because just to make your life easier and also just to be comfortable and wow you could just get some some information that's crazy like honestly this has been like this has been amazing for me. Like, yes. I really appreciate you talking to me and hearing about your stories and like advice. And like, it's been really inspiring. And yeah, this is sick. <laughs> great to meet you. Have a great, have a super fun tour now. Oh, thank you. And you too. Good luck with your shows and like everything. Yeah, thank you. It'll be fun. Thanks for listening to the Talk House podcast. And thanks to Nina and B for chatting. If you like what you heard, please follow TalkHouse on your favorite podcasting platforms and social channels. And don't forget to check out all the great written content at TalkHouse.com. This episode was produced by Melissa Kaplan, and the TalkHouse theme is composed and performed by The Range. See you next time.